Here we go, one more time. Um, so we're, we, we've got that shear diagram. And um, we come up 30 on account of the reaction. We come over to where that load is. The load is um, has an area under it of 120. So we're at 30, we go down 120, which gets us down to the negative 90. We have a slope in there, which I'm not going to dare to write on that line. I'm just going to tell you that the slope of the uh, shear diagram is equal to the value of the distributed load, which is negative 30. Okay. So that, that's what we got there. Okay. So there's the shear diagram. So if you want to find tau max, you want V max is what you want. And that's going to be, even though it's a 90, it's, you're looking for the absolute value to be the max. So that has a value of 90. Okay. So I, I, people don't often bother with the signs on shear. It's just not a big deal. They're not nearly as significant as, as it is for normal uh, force stress. Because you know, the, the, the sign change in normal stress is the difference between tension and compression. And materials act differently in tension and compression. But the sign change in shear isn't really a big deal. It's just sliding one way versus sliding another. And materials don't act much differently in either mode. All right, so there's our maximum shear. It's uh, 90 kips, I think. Yeah. All right, kip being 1,000 pounds. All right, now what we're going to do then is just uh, divide that by the area, not of the whole beam, but just the web. And the idea is that's where most of the shear occurs. So if you take the 90 kips and you divide it by the area of the web, you'll get uh, what we will design the beam for. Okay, so the area of the web is 0.19 inches, which is the thickness, times 9.45 inches, which is the height. So it's about 1.8 square inches. Okay. Now, I looked up the uh, properties of that beam, I think, in a uh, handbook or whatever. I got the depth of the beam is 9.87 inches, and then I've got the thickness of, the, of each of the flanges is 0.21. So that's why I'm getting that 9.45. I'm taking the total depth of the I-beam there. I'm subtracting off two times the thickness of the flanges. Okay. All right, so once I've got all that, I just plug it in easy enough. So the shear is 90,000 pounds divided by that area, and that comes out to be 50,125 pounds per square inch. That's what you would design that beam for. Okay. So we good with that? Questions? Okay. Now, now, there's some other things we can do with shear, though, um, and then we get back to that VQ over IT formula, okay? And we're going to work with that one a little bit and do a couple things with it. There's something called shear flow, and there's also something called shear center that we look at. Okay. So let's have a look at those. And those are in the next pages of the book. I've got some uh, notes on those things. Come on, page uh, eight, seven, four. All right, now the standard formula for shear stress is tau is VQ over IT. That gives shear force per unit area of beam. So that's, uh, that's a stress, force over area. Now, in some structural applications, we custom fabricate beams. Okay, they make timber box beams sometimes by nailing boards together and getting a hollow box there that can be used. Sometimes they do tack welding and weld plates onto I-beams or even custom fabricate I-beams. Okay. These are called built-up beams. There's different ways of putting them together, but quite often um, they're put together with connectors. Okay. So where, where I'm going with this is like a regular I-beam is all just one solid piece of material. What's holding the flange to the, uh, to the web is that solid material in there, okay? Now, when you do a built-up beam, it's different. What happens is quite often you replace solid material with a connector. So if that's uh, like a wooden beam, you might pound nails in there. So you're getting stress buildups on the connectors. And this, this can be caused by shear, okay? 
So you can figure out the, um, the forces that build up in the connectors by just modifying the shear flow formula a little bit. Okay. Now what you've got for, for the total shear formula is VQ over IT. Now what T is, is this distance in this example. T would be that distance across the web that's holding the web and the flange together. Well, what you're doing with shear flow is you're, you don't have that T anymore. So what you end up with for the shear for, flow formula, which is usually shown with a lowercase f, this is VQ over I. And what you end up with then is a force per unit length along the beam. Okay. And this is kind of the, gets, you can use this to get the force buildup in the connectors on the beam. So the, the way I think about this is I'm replacing the thickness of a beam, the T part, with a connector. And so by taking the T out of the formula, because it's not being used to hold the beam together anymore, you can now figure out the stress of the force buildup along the length of the beam. That's kind of the idea. You're taking one of those length dimensions out of the formula is what you're doing. Right. There's a built-up column, might be kind of hard to see, but that's just an I column, and then they've welded a T connection on there, like that. I think they were trying to stiffen this thing up for earthquake, I think is what they were trying to do. You can see it, There's you're looking on the flanges of the original I, and then tucked in there, they've got a half an I kind of welded in there. Gives it a little bit more all-around strength, I think. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I think that's what was going on here. It's a built-up column. Actually, they might have bolted that in there. I didn't realize they'd done it that way, but there you go. Okay, so there's the bolt. You can get stresses that build up in that bolt. Okay. So let's look at an example of how you might do that. Okay. Okay, so we're going to do shear flow, which is F. It's VQ over I. All right, and here's the idea. If, if you, uh, instead of gluing these laminations together, if you had a nail that was coming up through here and that's how it was being held together with a series of nails, what would happen when you load that thing up is each one of those layers is one, going to want to bend slightly differently and end up being a slightly different length. Okay, when the thing starts off, it's a rectangular beam, but then when you apply those loads, it, it starts to bend and flex. And each piece of that beam wants to flex a little bit differently. Okay, so those, those layers on the beam want to slide one across the other. Well, if when the beam wasn't loaded at all, you know, which is normally when you, of course, when you'd work on it, if it was just a rectangular beam and you made the connections in there by pounding nails in there, like so, once, uh, and you know, down from the bottom too, once you bend that beam, those different layers are going to want to slide one across the other, and the only thing preventing that is the nails. Okay, so so the nails are going to build up forces. Is what's going to happen? So we can use this shear flow to figure out how much force builds up in the nail. That, that's the idea. Okay. And it's a very similar to the shear stress approach. It's just a shear force. It's VQ over I. All right. So F is VQ over I. I'm on page eight seventy five. Let's say we've uh, made an I-beam like this. We've got a big board in the middle that's a true two by eight, and then we've got one by twos that we've nailed into the sides. Let's figure out the spacing if we only want to put 40 pounds on the nails for force, okay? So what we've got to do here, we're going to do V, Q, and I. All right, now, I've done I already. Now, I did kind of a nice little trick on I if you want to avoid the whole transfer axis thing. Now, this only works for symmetrical beams, okay? So be aware of that. But what you have here, instead of doing transfer axis, you could treat that as one whole rectangle and then cut out the two rectangles on the side because all three of those things are lined up right on the cent neutral axis of the beam the centroids of the overall rectangle and the two cutouts are all right on the neutral axis. So you don't need to do a, a 
I sub x, I bar plus AD squared thing on that, okay? You can just do a subtraction. So I'm doing the overall dimension of that entire box, six by eight, so six times eight cubed over 12, then I'm subtracting off the two smaller cutouts, which are two by six, okay? Oh, so I go two times six cubed over 12, multiply that by two and subtract it off, I get 184, okay? So that's, that's a, that'll work, but it only works on symmetrical beams. Don't try and do that with a T-beam or something like that. It won't work, okay? Because the centroids of the shapes on a T-beam are not aligned on the neutral axis. Okay, so, so just be aware of that. Okay. So that's our I for the beam cross-section. It's 184. Can I get that shear diagram quick enough? It's something like that, right? 480, negative 480, zero and zero. Okay, there we go. We all right with that with the shear? So our value of shear is gonna be 480. Again, we don't always worry a lot about sign when we're doing shear, when we're doing shear type calculations. So we got V is 480, and we got I is 184. All right. Now Q might be a little funny, but we can go ahead and calculate it, all right? So, um, okay, so there we go. So um, there's V is 480, I is 184. And then just, just be sure you put this note in here, because we're gonna run down and do some T-beams in our homework and all that. Don't don't attempt this approach on T-beams. They just don't work. It just doesn't work, okay? Because, again, the centroids of a T-beam, of the shapes of a T-beam, if you use this cutout approach, they are not lined up on the neutral axis. See, the neutral axis of that thing is going to be up here if you then use this approach of taking the whole rectangle, the centroid for that is going to be down there. The centroid for the cutouts will be down there. Nothing's lined up on the neutral axis, okay? So it won't work. You can't do this subtraction approach on a T-beam. It just don't work. Anything, an L-beam, same thing, wouldn't work, okay? Only if the beam's symmetrical about the X-axis will it work, okay? All right. So what we want to do here uh, next is we want to find Q, okay? So let's find Q for one of these little sections of the, um, of the beam. So what we want to do is we're, we got one nail in there. We're going to find Q for that one piece. So let's see if we can find Q for that. Now what Q is, is the area that would shear off times the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of that area. Now, don't worry about the fact that that thing's kind of nailed in from the side. That does not affect Q at all. All Q is is the area that would shear off times the distance from the neutral axis to the area. I want you to spend three or four minutes looking at that, or maybe one or two minutes, whatever. Find Q for, for one of those little flanges that's nailed in. You got questions, you know, let me know. We're, we're looking at the area that would shear off times the distance from the neutral axis to the center of the area that would shear off. Now this is a little different than what we were looking at earlier because the shear line is vertical, not horizontal, but that does not affect the calculation on Q at all. You're just looking at the area that would shear off times that distance.
You have seven inches cube, something like that. So the area that'll shear off is two by one. It's one of those little pieces of flange. Then the distance from the neutral axis to the center is three and a half. Okay. And that's about it. Okay. Y'all, y'all okay with that? Okay. That's that's the deal. All right, so now we got the three things. We got V, Q, and I, so we can go ahead and find what we call the shear flow. So we just uh, plug that in, and that's 780 pounds times 7 inches cubed, which is Q there, V, uh, 480. So 480 pounds times 7 inches cubed divided by I, 184. And F, the shear flow, comes out to be 18.26 pounds per inch. So what that means is that 18.26 pounds of shear force builds up along each length, each inch of length of the beam. Okay. You all okay with that? That's measured along the length. Okay. All right, so once we got that number, if we know our nails can hold 40 pounds, we can go ahead and find the spacing on the nails. You take the 40 pounds divided by the force per unit length. If you look at the units there, the inches will come up top. You get 2.19 inches. All right. And then we're going to space those nails as shown. Okay? So 2.19 would be the optimal, you know, the most efficient spacing. If i am got a bunch of carpenters knocking these out, I'm probably not going to tell them 2.19 inch spacing, so I'm probably going to tell them 2 inch spacing is probably what I'm going to tell them, okay? It's in the interest of, of getting along and, and making sure they don't have to be measuring things out quite that exactly, okay? But if, you know, if I were building that thing in a factory, I might like go 2.19 if I had the means to do it. I don't know, it just depends, but yeah, this just depends on the situation. But, but what we calculated there is 2.19. So we are right with that. So, you know, all these calcs are simple enough to do, but we do have to kind of keep track of what, you know, which way the dimensions go. This is along the length of the beam is what it is. And, uh, Okay, and, and what these different things mean. So if you look in your formula sheet, sheet, Q just says A times D. A means the area that would shear off. D means the distance from the neutral axis to the center of the area. So just remember that, okay? So that's shear flow. Now we also got this other thing that's kind of weird. It's called shear center, okay? Now the shear actually flows through a beam and it can cause kind of a, a moment and can cause beams to warp when you apply forces to them. I'm on page 876. Okay. So you kind of think of shear as being like a fluid that flows through the beam cross section. And this can be a bit of a problem. And an example of this would be C-channel frames. There used to be one of the, it's one of the big three truck companies used to make their frames out of C-channel. They don't anymore. They make them out of tube, I think. But this was back in the 
70s or 80s or something, I don't know, but they, they it might have been GM, but I, I, I can't remember which one did. But they made their frames out of C-channel, kind of like this old frame that you're seeing here. That's C-channel, of course, it's so shady, it's hard to see in there, but by C-channel, there's C-channel too. What I mean by that is a, a beam with a cross section like that. Okay. More modern frames are made with tubing, which is a, like a, a hollow box. No, two. All right. Now, what the deal was with this, you know, there's some C channel right there. It's an old frame made out of C channel. Now, that's all fine, but the problem is when you load C channel, even if you load it over the centroid, which is kind of the normal place to load something, you'll warp it. It'll kind of twist. Okay? Now, we can handle bending down. That's fine when we're doing structures. But when we start getting twists like that, that can be trouble. You can think about, you know, on a frame of a truck, if you've got things going through the frame, things attached to the frame, things like axles and stuff like that, start warping that frame like that. That's not going to work very well, okay? So we want to avoid what I'm showing you there on the left. And the way to do it is to offset the load away from the um, twisting action of the frame. So if the frame is going to kind of twist that way, you offset the load to the left to create a counter moment that'll balance it and go back the other way. And that's what you do, okay? And those trucks I was talking about, and again, I can't remember which brand made them that way, but what they did when they, you know, on a truck frame or any kind of vehicle frame, you got to mount the motor to the frame and you use what are called motor mounts to do that, right? If you pull the motor or something, you probably see those things. Well, what they did, they built motor mounts that extended in from that C channel so the load was offset. They didn't want the motor sitting right on the frame because it would warp it a little bit, so they offset it. If you look at the motor mounts on these, um, and I, I, you know, th that's how it was done, okay? And so there's a calculation you can do to figure out what that off offset ought to be to, to counteract this twisting action, okay? All right, so I've got an example of this um, on page 877. Okay. And I went ahead, I've got the beam, I've got the load. Um, let's figure out where we're going to load this thing so it won't twist on us. Okay. All right, so what's, what I did here, I know I'm going to need the moment of inertia. So again, that thing is symmetrical about its own neutral axis. I've got a, a box with a cutout. So I went ahead and did that trick for I. Now again, that won't work with T beams, it won't work with L beams, but it will work with a C channel like that. So I went ahead and did it. The outer BH cube over 12 minus the inner BH cube over 12 gets me 0.0002506. Okay. Now what's going to happen here is you're going to get a shear flow pattern kind of like this running through this beam. And that beam will warp up. So what we're going to do, we're going to use a moment kind of approach to figure out how far to offset that load. So I don't want to be calculating all these shear flows running through the beam. So I'm going to take moments about a point where two of them intersect. I'm going to take the moment about that point right there in the corner, which is in the middle of the web and where it intersects the middle of the flange. So I'm going to, and so that way, all I got to deal with is this one. Okay. The other two, then, when I take moments about that point, we'll, we'll cancel out. All right, I've got a little picture there of the shear distributions. Shear kind of increases as you get away from the edges of the beam. So those are the shear distributions shown on there. And then I've got that point that I'm calling A, where I'm going to take moments about. Okay. So shear is different than bending stress. It, it uh, is low at the edge of the beam, higher as you work your way away from the edge of the beam. And then I've got that point A, which again is at the midpoint of the intersection of the midpoints of the beam and the flange, or the, excuse me, the web and the flange. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure up the shear force by unfortunately integrating the uh, shear flow. That's how I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do that for that lower flange on this beam. Okay, so this is a little bit of mathematics here. So I'm going to find F equals VQ over I for the lower flange of the C channel. The lower flange is right down there. Okay. So 
So V will come off the shear diagram. That's not a big deal. I have already got, I need to figure out Q as I work my way across for this flange. And that's where I'm going to have to do a bit of a calculus kind of stuff, okay, for Q. All right, now, where this is at, from the neutral axis down to the centroid of that flange is 9 centimeters. It's half of the 12 plus half of the 6. It's 9. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider the flange to go halfway into the web, which I'm pretty sure is just an empirical approach, assuming that the flange extends halfway into the web. We're kind of taking that material, giving half of it to the web above, half of it to the flange. So I've got 18 plus half of 6. That makes 21. That's how far over I'm going to assume my flange goes. So I don't think we're in the, the realm of exact... Uh, analysis here. I think we're kind of making some assumptions and doing some things to calculate this out. So this is a little bit more on the engineering side as opposed to the pure science side with what we're doing here, okay? All right, now I'm going to find AD. Now A is the area that would shear off. That's going to be the thickness of the flange times whatever my distance X is. That's 0.06X will be the A. The distance will be that 9 centimeters. I want that in meters, so that's 0.09. So Q will be the product of the two, the area times the offset distance. It's 0.0054 times X. And the units on that are meters cubed. So the X is a variable, and the M cubed, of course, is a unit. They're, they're different things, okay? Now, again, like I'm saying, that, that shear is going to vary as I work my way across the flange. So I'm going to have to integrate this out to sum this up. What I've got there is Q for any particular location X from the side of the flange, what I need to do is to kind of get this shear flow as I'm working my way across. So the first thing I'll do, I'll take F is VQ over I. So I've got Q is 0.0054X. V is whatever it is on the shear diagram. That'll just translate down to this location. So this calculation is independent of V. V is just the value of the shear diagram. And then down below, I've got I. If I collect terms, I get my shear flow term there. V times 21.55 times whatever X is. So that's the shear flow at any distance X on that flange. Okay. And that's newtons per meter. Now what I'm going to want to do is add that up over the 21 centimeter distance. And so I have to integrate it because that value of Q changes as I work my way across. Okay, So I've got to integrate that out from 0 to 0 0.21 meters, 21 centimeters, okay, to get my total shear force. So there's the shear flow. I'm going to do a little bit of an integration there and get the shear force. Okay, So I'm going to go 0 to 0 0.21 of that shear flow expression. V times 21.55x dx. Okay. The V can come out because V is just a constant as I do this integration. It's whatever the, the shear is on the shear diagram. So that's not going to change as I integrate. So I can pull that out. I'm just going to integrate then 21.55x. I'm going to get 10.77x squared, 0 to 0.21. So I'll plug in the values. And what I end up with then is the shear force on that flange. It's 0.4752 times whatever the shear is off the shear diagram. Okay. All right. So now I got that. That's a force is what that is because I've taken the shear flow in newtons per meter and integrated it over a distance, so now that's newtons is what that is, if I'm in, if I'm in the metric system. Okay, that would be newtons. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the moment of that about point A. Okay, all right with that? So I'm going to find the moment that causes about point A. So my distance there is... Um, I have to, so what I want there is the, the distance to get that moment. Now, I, I got point A is in the middle of that flange, 
half a six is three. From there, I go down three to get to the base of the flange, 12 to get to the top of the flange below, and three more to get in the middle of that flange. So three plus 12 plus three gets me 18 centimeters down, which is 0.18 meters. So I multiply that by the shear force. That gets me the moment. So that's the moment about A that that is caused by the shear flow in the lower flange. And that's what I need to balance with wherever I put in the, um, the load, how I transmit that load down to the C channel. So I want to balance that out. So I want to figure out where I'm going to put this load, which is really the shear load, it's V. So I'll call that V over there. And I'm going to VE, E being the eccentricity, how far to set it over from A. Okay. And that's equal, I want that to balance out this moment. So I just set them equal and solve for E. It's 8.554 centimeters. So that's from point A, not from the edge of the beam, but from point A. That's where I'll set that load up there. So if I was working for that truck company, that's where I'd put the motor mounts and have that load come in. That will balance the twisting action on the C-channel and keep everything nice and square like I want it to be. Okay. Questions on that? Alright, so we'll get you some of these to do. Um, get you a few of these, I'm afraid. So let's see. And, uh, I want to give you a, that handout, that uh, sure and moment problem handout. And then I'll get you some more shear problems to do. So, and then let's see. So what I've given you here so far, I think was uh, was it 344? Was that that sure and moment? Yeah, 351, 353. I'm going to get you some more here. So 361 and 2, those are just straight up shear problems. And then 371 and 372. So that's quite a list. We'll start going over these on Monday, I think, is what we'll start doing. Um, yeah, 371, 372. And so those are due on Wednesday, okay? And I'll get those back to you before the final. Um, Wednesday is the 11th, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. So we're good to go. I handed one of them out, the 344. It, I think I've got some here. They're available online too, but I've got oh, some here. Okay. You know, but they're online, but for those of you online, but I've got, got them here too. Okay. Yeah, I think I. Uh, had something written out incorrectly there. It's 372. I think I had 327 written down, but it's actually 372. All right, so, so there you go.